Kayla. She's a professor in the University of Glasgow. Uh, Kate's a brilliant researcher working with the biogeomorphology of marshes and mangroves. And he has been publishing a very fine piece of works on the hydrogeological and geomorphological adjustment of natural and artificial realigned ecosystems. Today, he will be sharing with us his last insights on identifying suitable sites for mangrove restoration using the low cost self assembly and open source mini boy hydrology sensor. Um, just a few last notes before the talk. Um, as you all know, the seminar will last more or less for 40, 45 minutes. Uh, it will be recorded and the chat for questions will be open just a few minutes before at the end of the talk. So um, please feel free also to join us on further discussions in our new Discord channel. Uh, thank you so much, Clay, for accepting our invitation. It is a pleasure for having you here. And the floor is yours. Go ahead. Well, thanks, Rita. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so yeah, I'm based, uh, I'm Kai at University of Glasgow and I'm a PDRA and I'm based with the Living Deltas uh, project. So it's a large project working between the UK and India, Bangladesh and Vietnam, where we're trying to find pathways to achieving sustainable deltas. And my small role in that is as the PDRA to looking specifically at mangrove forests and trying to understand um, how they change, um, how they expand and how they decline, and how we can use tools and information to uh, protect them and restore them as well. And we, uh, the main sort of my main thing has been to develop uh, this, the device that you can see here called the Mini Boy. And Rita bravely went through the title, which is way too long, but it's got all the keywords. It's got low cost, it's got self-assembled, open source, this is a device that's meant to be used by research community and beyond in order to hopefully um, help restore really vital, important mangrove forests. So in this talk, I'll tell you a little bit about what the device actually is, how we assemble it, how it works, and then um, how we've been applying it. And then I'll try and sort of wrap up by placing it in the context of why the geoscience community benefit from this and other event, uh, sensors like it. <clears throat> So just for a bit of context then, uh, mangrove forests are, are coastal forests, so they're very specialised um, plants that can tolerate salt, uh, salt water in the ground and in the water when the tide comes in and out. And they have a, a sort of a global distribution, but centred around the tropics. They grow in the warmer parts of our planet. And that's what this map here shows. So we can see the, the black line, uh, he, oh, well, yeah, the light blue line here is, 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 is showing where those mangrove forests are located. And this is a map produced by the Blue Carbon Ecosystems Group. Um, so they are really famous, mangrove forests are really famous for um, the amount of carbon that they capture, both in the tree itself, but also in the soil. Um, so they are really important stores of carbon, but they also continue to capture it. So it's sort of one of the really important reasons why we should look after them and protect them and restore them for the purposes of mitigating the climate crisis. But perhaps even more famously than that, they're known for their ability to protect against coastal flooding. There's no better way really to see that than in a video. There's a great video online. If it's not really working on your end, the link is at the bottom. But it's a wave tank with an artificial forest in there. And you really get the sense of just how well these plants um, attenuate wave energy and prevent flooding. So all that energy is absorbed as it tries to pass through that really dense root structure and the leaf um, architecture as well. So you've got sort of placid land, placid water behind. Unfortunately, though, like most of the ecosystems on our planet, they've been in decline. So um, since 1996, there's been at least 6,000 kilometers squared of forest uh, lost. And the reason it's 1996 is that uh, this data comes from satellite observation data uh, run by the Global Mangrove Watch. There's a little link at the bottom. These are sort of one of the main groups that are really tracking mangrove change, where it's expanding, where it's declining. And, you know, the losses were, were extended way beyond 1996 as well. And we've seen a huge loss in mangrove forests around the world. And... But alongside that, there's also been a real drive to try and restore these environments as well. 
Uh, Vietnam in particular is a bit of a highlight of, in terms of the amount of effort that's gone into from central government to really try and restore degraded forests. And, and what we're actually starting to see is that this, this flat, this curve here, which represents total loss, is starting to flatten out. That might partly be because there's no forest left to destroy, but actually restoration activity has started to, to sort of turn that trend around. And the activity that we've seen so since the millennium has been vast in Vietnam alone, around 200,000 hectares of, of, of area have been planted at some point. However, and it's a big however, um, a lot of those plantations are failing. And the failure rates can be as high as 70% in some locations. And that's failure in the long term, failure for these planted forests to become mature, to start to produce their own seed and become self-sustaining. And so, so it's, 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 you can imagine all the effort going into that and seeing up, to, you know, at worst only 30% success rate. And the main reason that tends to happen is because the wrong species are being planted in the wrong places. So um, to go a little bit more into that, imagine now you're a mangrove seedling, right? And this is the environment you're trying to grow on. So this is an expansive mudflat, and this is in Vietnam, in the north northeast coast. It's a harsh environment. It's a really difficult environment to survive, particularly if you're a seedling. So when you drop from the parent tree, you'll have to grow enough of a seed to prevent the tide from carrying you away when it comes in. And then over the next few days, as we get to a spring tide, we get stronger currents, we get stronger waves that either cause scouring and dislodge the seedling or maybe bring in sediment to deposit on top of that seedling, smothering it and killing it. And those trees need to overcome that sort of environment. So really, they're very sensitive to the physical environment uh, in terms of what is suitable for growth. Um, and then not all species are the same. So some uh, pioneer species that uh, uh, have evolved to be able to grow on more exposed settings, others aren't. And so when you put the wrong tree and mismatch it with the wrong location, failure is almost inevitable. And so this is one of the major challenges when we think about restoration of mangrove forests. It's actually selecting sites that are suitable for that restoration activity to take place. And so when we think about how to identify sites, um, there's lots of ways we can do that. The very first one is expert opinion. A lot of these sites have wardens, they're managed, and the wardens who look after the site are also usually the ones who do the forest restoration work as well. And so they're knowledgeable of the area, um, they might know, they might understand almost at an intuitive level where <clears throat> planting can be done. But there are other factors at play. Usually uh, there's pressure on, on, on planting, uh, a set number in a set period of time, regardless of where that actually is. There might be top-down pressure that really overrides any localized expertise. And of course, without any kind of data and relying on intuition alone, that might not really be sufficient um, for selecting the best sites. We've seen incredible advances in remote sensing um, and coupled with that numerical modeling, ways to integrate both to be able to start produce maps that predict habitat suitability, which areas are going to succeed, which areas aren't. But inherently, you know, they are, they have to generalize. They can't necessarily account either for really localized site-specific variation. It's not just about tides, currents, and waves. It's about the sediment type that's there, the nutrients that are coming in, the types of species, the sort of the within species variation between them. And so we have um, hydro, we have sensors as well that we can use. And I've got a few here. So the top, this is an ADV, um, acoustic Doppler velocimeter. It measures uh, the movement of water directly by looking at the movement of particles that go above the transmitter. You've got other simpler ones like uh, tilt current meters that just dip in the, in the current. So the stronger the dip, the stronger the current and um, other sort of acoustic devices as well. There's all sorts on the market. Um, but a common trend with those is that they're expensive. They can also be fairly specialist, a little bit difficult to use. And so that hampers to a degree their usage in the research community and by the experts you know, who are planting these, these trees. Um, and what often happens then, if the cost is prohibitive, you might only be able to deploy one logger at one location. And you might not necessarily want to put it in areas that are particularly exposed or have a lot of footfall. There's a lot of activity in the area that might lead it to be stolen. 
So can you, you know, how well can you infer from one or a handful of data points to extrapolate across a much larger area and decide where is suitable for planting or not? So it's a big challenge um, to get good data on site suitability. And that is one um, sort of question that was in the mind of my boss, Torsten Balk, um, thinking, how, how can we kind of address that, that gap? So before I started, he experimented and he thought he wondered if you can use some inexpensive sensors that are now on the market to infer hydrodynamics. And one such sensor would be an accelerometer and one like this. So an accelerometer measures movement, it measures motion. You've got them in your smartphone, you've got them in your smartwatch, and um, they essentially measure movement in relation to the pull of the Earth's gravity. So a very, very common device in everything. And um, you could potentially interpret that movement into hydrodynamics. So if you put it in a float and it wobbles around as a current comes over the top. So Torsten gave it a go and yes, it turns out it works. And we call these devices mini boys or mini buoys, depending where you are in the world. Um, and the graph here sort of shows how, how, you know, what they are. So essentially all you need is a centrifuge tube and you tether that to um, a metal stake, a bamboo pole that goes into the ground. Um, and then the logger sits inside that. The tube floats so it can move around freely on that anchor and start to give us some information about the movement of the tide. So we've already published on one device. I came in then and started um, improving it, ad adapting it for different purposes. So we've got the original B4 mini boy, which is named after the logger, the B4 plus, and then uh, a newer one again, which is using a different logger entirely called the pendant. And um, essentially the sort of the core differences are with the slightly newer model, um, it's, it's a little bit more robust than the first one. So the black casing is UV resistant. The fishing line doesn't get clogged up with any sand and grain that might get between the revolving bits of the fishing swivel. We added a little bit of lead shot to make it a little bit more unstable, which means it was a little bit more sensitive to picking up currents and, and waves. And then even more recently, um, Torsten tried out uh, this, this device here. So it's, um, it's, it's a built-in logger. You don't, need to be, you, know, you don't need to assemble anything. You can buy it like that, tether it to a post and you're good to go. There's sort of advantages and disadvantages of all of them. For example, the new one, yes, it's easier to use. You don't have to really build anything. However, um, it doesn't have as much memory. So um, in that sense, the, the, the B4 is a little bit better. You can see at the bottom then uh, what they look like in situ. And I've, I've got one here as well for scale, but I'm sure as scientists, you all know what a centrifuge tube looks like. Um, oh yeah, so <laughs> that's it. So, I mean, what, what's quite amazing about this is that the sensors advancing or evolving so quickly that even probably by this talk you know this will be out of date they are becoming cheaper they're becoming a uh, larger memory larger battery capacity there's a lot of potential for this sort of technology and uh yeah it, it feels like quite a game to sort of keep up with it so in terms of how it works then i've got a graph here showing the uh the raw data so this is a time series of acceleration over time and what we've got is the mini boy it has got it so it measures acceleration on three axes and um, the y-axis is pointing up that's the one we're interested in and it just so happens the way the logger is positioned in it's actually sort of downwards so zero would be lying flat minus one would be upright so it's a little bit counterintuitive flat like that is zero minus one is upright so um we've basically got a scenario where it can be lying flat in the tidal flat or up in the water when the tide comes in so this little graph shows how or this plot, uh, video shows how it works, starts flat and the tide comes in. So it lifts like that to minus one. And then if there's a current, it starts to push against that mini boy and it causes it to tilt. So the steeper the tilt, the stronger the current. And if a wave passes over the top, it begins to sway back and forth. So we can measure that swaying motion and infer wave action from that. And then finally, when the tide goes out, the mini boy gradually returns to rest. So if you take point for the timestamp on point four and subtract it from point one, uh, you've got the duration of inundation, which is one of those key parameters. How long is the tide in for? You've got the tilt, which gives us the strength of the current. 
and the wobble that gives us the waves. So we can get all three from a single signal, uh, which is great. So the next thing then, of course, is to determine, you know, is it any good at actually measuring hydrodynamics? So we did um, a series of calibration experiments. We got some mini boys out on the tidal flat uh, adjacent to one of these ADVs. So this is the creme de la creme of um, measuring hydrodynamics. It's a direct measure of hydrodynamics. It's got high accuracy um, and it can measure turbulent flow as well, the sort of 3D motion of the water. Very expensive too, so you don't want to lose this. Um, and we basically compared what that was picking up with what the miniboys were picking up. We also, somewhere out here in the channel, slightly below the miniboy, had a water level logger. So we know then exactly when the miniboys are underwater or not, because we need that information to infer inundation from that. So I'll talk you through now the sort of the calibration steps to get to that. Um, so the very first one is inundation, right? Is the mini boy covered by the tide or not? And it doesn't measure water level directly, which you can get from a pressure sensor. So more pressure, more water above it. What you can do instead is you can look at the acceleration signal and infer from that if it's moving or not. And that's what this horribly complicated plot shows. So plots with lines with L are for, for low tide, H are for high tide. And what we, <clears throat> what we have are two data clusters. There's one up here and there's one down here. And then there's a bit of fuzz in between the two. And um, what we can do is we, we, we know from the signal its inundation status. Remember zero was lying flat. Um, so we've got the mean tilt from minus one to zero on this axis. And then this is basically wobble. So this is the interquartile range. The larger the range, the greater range of acceleration values there were. And so what's happening here is we've got it's lying flat at zero and there's zero variation. So the tide's out. That's at the top here. Down here, though, we've got an accelerometer that's totally upright and standing still. But as we move along the point cloud, there's more swaying motion. And, and we look at this in a one minute window. So the amount of sway in one minute window and the mean or median acceleration value in that as well. So what you can do then is you can use a classifier algorithm. There's, there's loads of them out there. It's a machine learning method that tries to define the optimum split between the two data clouds. And that's exactly what this shading shows here using a uh, linear discriminant analysis, for example. And so everything above that line is probably inundated. Everything below that line probably, um, or sorry, vice versa, is and isn't. So that's great. We have a good method uh, and the accuracy of this is, is high. So it, it, it shows the points in red if it's been misclassified. Um, but I mean, you're looking at a, an error rate of around sort of 95 to, yeah, 95% as in getting it right 95% of the time. There is a downside though. So imagine you've got a mini boy like that. Is that a mini boy that is partially inundated? So the tide is still coming in. Or is it fully inundated and there's a really strong current pushing it? So we need to be able to separate those from partial inundated cases and fully inundated cases. And we can do that by looking at the, the start and end of inundation events. So I'll, I'll show that with, with, with an example here. This is a very cool site. So this is one of the first restored salt marshes in Wales, which is where I'm from. Um, so there was a sea defence which broke and the land behind re-wetted and there's a new salt marsh growing in what used to be farmland. Um, oops, I'll start the video. There's a bit of audio as well, so you can see the strength of the current going through there. And this is just the tide coming in at that location. And in there, there's a mini boy um, and it managed to survive, which is fantastic. And that is the data that we see from that mini boy. Uh, so it was for a, you know, for, for a month period, you can really see the spring and neap cycles um, coming through with the dark blue being fully inundated, the light blue being periods of non-inundation, and then this fuzz that represents those partial inundated cases. And what we've done, I've zoomed into the highest spring tide here. And this is a good example where a mini boy could be lying flat where the tide isn't in, and it could be lying flat because the current is that strong, it's horizontal. And we can basically look at the shape of the data. Uh, there's a rapid shift here from, from zero to, to 90 degrees from horizontal. 
And we've got an algorithm that basically plots lots of linear regression of uh, fits on there and looks at the gradient of change. When the gradient is steep enough, it classifies that as partially inundated cases. And it's a really reliable way to actually snip off the bits that aren't relevant. If this were classified as full inundation, then we would see really high currents, which are nothing to do with currents. It's just that the mini boy is coming to life flat again. Just as a little demonstration as well, we tried this on a different data set back in Vietnam, huge tidal flat, really gradual rise and fall of the tide. And in fact, the tide barely left when we were there. So the mini boy was always slightly uh, inundated anyway. So you've got a very sort of different type of, cur of, of, of look to the raw data here. But again, if we zoom in, you can see this algorithm has done a really nice job of separating out partially inundated cases, leaving behind the peak flood. So when the tide comes in, there's a, there's a, there's a peak as that comes in. And then the peak ebb as well as the tide goes back out. So we're able to get those, you know, the, 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 the key flows that might really be driving sediment flux in our, in our environment. So great to have that working. Um, so that's inundation. We know now we've got a good way to detect if the mini boy is in and it fully under and, and not under at all or, or somewhere in between. So now we're going to look at the full inundation data only and see how that compares to the flow rates that our really fancy ADV sensor was, was showing. And we've got those calibration curves for each one of the mini boy sensors. So we've got tilt going from um, zero to um, totally upright. And then you can see then, you know, you've got, uh, where, well, yeah. So, so this would be at 90 degrees, it's lying um, flat, zero, it's upright. <laughs> These values keep jumping around, but you can see how it affects the current velocity. And um, so what we have, first of all, is our mini boys that can measure right the way down to a detection limit of, you know, 0.04 uh, to 0.02 meters per second. Uh, pendant being slightly worse than 0.05 meters per second. So it's a device that works pretty well at, at, at low velocities. And the fit of that uh, data is very strong. The pendant sensor, interestingly, actually has um, higher, it, it's more accurate than the sensors that went in these two, which is why the R squared is, is even better. But it's a good correlation. It shows it works effectively. So all we have to do is measure the tilt, the, the mean tilt in one minute period we can find out what the current velocities are. So at the moment, I mean, the, we extrapolate up to about one meter, but we've got to be a little bit careful of that because there is missing data. We don't know for sure if the trend changes slightly at these higher flow rates, but certainly we can measure current velocities that you typically see in these sort of fairly calm coastal environments. And then we move on to waves. So um, there's lots of ways you can look at waves. Uh, the most intuitive would be wave height. So how large the wave is going over the tidal flat. There's another one called wave orbital velocity, which is essentially the effect of the wave on near the bed where the mini boy is. So it's a bit of wave theory orbitals. Um, it's quite a cool idea so that when you get a wave passing um, through the sea, say, the wave clearly is going in some directions that the energy has been transmitted in a certain direction, but the water isn't going with it. Otherwise there'd be a big tsunami every time there was a, you know, a, a wave. So what happens is that that water is actually being circulated um, as the wave passes through it. And we call those orbitals. There's lots of these orbitals in the water column. They get slightly smaller as you get closer to the bed and they tend to get squashed a little bit as well to the point where that water is almost like a flat line kind of circulating like that. That is wave orbital velocity. And it's a good measure because depending on the size of that, we know how much forcing there is on the scour. And do you remember our seedling trying to survive in the tidal flat? If that wave orbital velocity is too high, we see scouring and deposition, that sort of thing. So we um, measured the wave dimensional spectra from the ADV and then related the swaying motion of the mini boy uh, being um, standard deviation and related that to wave orbital velocity. If we fit a one minute rolling standard deviation as well, we kind of take out a little bit the effect of currents and just look at waves alone. And this is the calibration that we get. So it's not bad. I mean, it's got an R squared value of 0.55. Um, detection limit down to nearly zero. It's actually slightly negative because there's error bars. 
are fairly large, but it does give us a good indication of, of exposure at the site, um, which is great. For the more intuitive wave height, it would be great to have a nice correlation with that, but it's 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 not great. It's it's a R squared value of 0.24. Uh, it is a technically a significant trend, but I mean the error bar around that's pretty high. So, you know, you, you you've and you've not got a huge range of, of data there really to look at either, which makes it a little bit tricky. So there's probably a little bit more work we can do to try and narrow it down, but it shows that in theory that the principle works and certainly look at wave orbital velocity we can get an idea of exposure on the seabed. So Torsen um, also um, developed the Miniboy app, uh, which is a way for hopefully researchers and beyond that managers say to gather data and have it analysed automatically for them. So alongside these low cost sensors, we've got open source software that we can use to build apps. And this was done using Shiny R um, and it's great, it's really cool. So uh, for this particular project, the application was for mangrove restoration practitioners to decide if a site's good for restoration or not. And there's a few ways you can think about how you might um, present information that's useful. Um, probably, one the, <clears throat> probably one of the best ways is to compare your target site that you want to restore with a naturally, a naturally occurring mangrove forest. So if that natural forest has sort of reached its natural limit, how does the hydronomics at that location compare with the site you want to survey? If the site here has got even more exposure to tides and currents and waves, then probably it's gone beyond the limit that it's going to survive and certainly gone beyond the limit that it's going to thrive. So we can put one mini boy in a reference site, one mini boy in a target site and compare them. So you get raw output like this, which just shows current velocity um, with every tide and it's split for the flood that comes in, the yep, that goes out. There's a range of statistics here. So, you know, mean current velocity, um, ebb flow uh, dynamics, how long the survey was out for, that sort of stuff. And then a handy little message at the bottom that gives you the manager some, some practical information. In this example, um, you know, the deployment could have been a little bit longer. You know, we want at least 15 days to get a full spring leap cycle. Um, the inundation seems to be within what we think is suitable for, for mangrove species, but the currents are a little bit high. So maybe this site isn't suitable from the perspective of current velocity. It's a cool app and it was a good um, you know, sort of first try, um, but we've been working on a way to uh, make it a lot more sort of user friendly and give it a bit of a refer, make it look a little bit nicer too. And we're going to generalize it to any sort of setting, not specifically for mangrove forests. So working with Marie um, in Dresden and Alejandra here in Glasgow, two of them really um, built this app um, and it looks fantastic. We hopefully are going to publish this soon um, and it'll either be available straight away online or probably more likely as like an app you can download and run. But essentially it has like an info page about the different sensors uh, and then a location to upload that data and then get the results from that. What we also want to add is um, statistical analysis of, you know, is your reference different, statistically different to your target site um, to then be able to give a better yes no answer this site is is better for restoration or just different and different enough from that location so that is slowly being done we're nearly ready with that very excited to to share that with you soon so i'll go through now and just give you some examples of how we've been applying this and the very first one would be in the work that we've already published um this was you know torsten's original mini boy design and um, what he did was to deploy lots of mini boys in an abandoned aquaculture pond in Indonesia. So aquaculture is a major threat to mangrove forests um, in the tropics. The trees are cut down, that area is used to grow shrimp. And in that process, the, uh, the environment can really change. The hydrodynamics can really change in the site. So when eventually it's abandoned because it's too toxic to grow shrimp, um, the trees don't necessarily just come back straight away. Uh, so there's a lot of interest in actually trying to restore these areas. Um, so what we did, or what Torsten did, was put lots of points down in the pond. And then um, you can see the locations of each with those little blue dots. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to play now, and you're going to see the dots get bigger when the tide is in. When the tide leaves, it's going to go down. 
so there we are. Those are the first ones. The tides come in and out again. And then there's a slightly bigger tide and it swirls around like a snail right the way to the middle and out again. I'll play that again if you missed it. So the tide comes in to about there, out. And then there's a much larger tide that comes all the way to the middle and out again. So clearly on this side of the pond, inundation duration is longer than in the middle. And that starts to chime a little bit with where we're seeing these new trees establishing. There were some that survived, um, you know, that hadn't been cut down when the pond established. And there's others that have started to naturally colonize. And what's quite cool is if you do this in lots of locations, you can start to compare the hydrodynamics between them. For abandoned pond one, we observed that the inundation duration was way higher than um, other sites. And that was actually because there was a sluice gate as well, keeping the tide in for longer. And that meant that, you know, physiologically, those trees, we do not expect them to be able to tolerate that. So over the long term, any trees that were there are probably going to die off. So we're starting to get some useful um, information we can give to managers. So since I've been on the project, then I've been exploring new ways um, that we can gather data from the mini boys um, to aid interpretation of, of, of the likelihood of restoration success or not and so on. Ideally, I'd have started in the tropics uh, in Vietnam and Bangladesh, but COVID came along, of course. So um, I had to instead look to another coastal habitat, salt marshes. And fortunately, I'm quite used to working with salt marshes. That's what I did before forest, mangrove forests. Um, so during the pandemic, uh, we deployed lots of mini boys along um, salt marsh edges. And one of the applications we wanted to do was to be able to see if we can detect the point at which these ecosystems either expand or erode. And when you look at these environments, it's very obvious what's going on. So we have expanding sites at the top here, very low lying patches of vegetation starting to grow out to the tidal flat versus an area that's eroding, a very clear cliff with lots of slumped material along the edge. And for the site we were interested in, uh, it's called Calaverock, it's in Southern Scotland. Um, it was a 20 kilometer marsh edge. And along that edge, we have some areas that are expanding and some areas that are eroding. And that's what these dots, these colored dots relate to. You can kind of see, you know, there's quite a large tidal flight on the Eastern side here, uh, which sort of, you know, indicates there's sediment building up on the tidal flat, allowing a marsh to start to grow out. Um, and then really big cliffs sort of in the centra, central sort of western part uh, and some more stable areas, others where that vegetation has expanded and declined at one location that we call a dynamic zone. So we put mini boys all the way along there. And this is the sort of the, the process data from that. And we managed to do it for a full year, which is really exciting. So we did have to go back to change them um, to refresh the memory and, and battery. Uh, but this ultimately ran for a full year. Um, the grey bars show where there's data missing. And unfortunately, there's quite a large period uh, sort of in sort of winter time because of bird flu. Um, it's an amazing site, this one, for wild uh, geese, really important site for migratory geese. And it decimated the population. It was, it was tragic. And the site was closed for a long period of time. So we weren't able to refresh those, those mini boys. But for the periods that we do have, we start to see some interesting seasonality coming in as well. So the first thing that might strike you is, uh, oh, we, so first of all, we've got um, a mini boy that is in an area that's expanding and a mini boy that's in an area that's eroding. And if we look at the amount of time they cover by the tide every day, it's, it's quite low. There's a very exposed site. It's only about 10% of the time to sort of 15% of the time of these sites covered on average. Um, so they're very exposed most of the time. And, and that's actually a lot more than other marshes that we see. The tidal range here is 7.5 metres, it's huge. So um, these marshes are really sitting high and dry um, at the top. And what's quite cool is if we fit a trend line, we, we start to see a bit of a drop in summer, um, which implies there's some seasonality with the tide. So mm, it it's, it's gets covered more in winter than it does in summer. And that then reflects a little bit on the currents as well. There's a bit of a trend line as well uh, that we see at both sites with, with, with lower current velocities in, in summer. And then the waves are a little bit sort of less clear, no real pattern perhaps, but there are some really big bursts here. And, and these peaks were common across every single mini boy because they picked up a tide, uh, sorry, a storm, a storm event. So we're getting, we're able to capture peak uh, tide, uh, flood events and then relate that back to, you know, how these, these sites are changing. 
so if we want to we've got lots of sites some are expanding some are eroding where might that line be that separates when we get one or the other so one way we can do that is for each mini boy we plot the inundation duration currents and waves and we get a horrible three-dimensional plot that are really hard to interpret so um it's 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 they're, they're hard to see but essentially what's happening within this space they'll there's started to be a cluster of points a cluster of points that are expanding and a cluster of points that are eroding and in the same way that we use classifiers to determine if a mini boy was underwater or not we can use classifiers to determine where that line is between eroding and expanding patches and that is exactly what this golden plane here shows that represents uh, the threshold as defined by one of these classifiers called the linear discriminant analysis. Um, and so depending on if you're on one side or the other, you're either in a sort of a, a domain of erosion or expansion. And the further into that zone you go, the more likely you are to see expansion or erosion. And what's quite cool then is that we can actually um, take the well if you want like the distance from one point to this golden plane and actually plot that and that gives us like a representation of the state of the ecosystem so negative values are ones uh, are um, conditions where the site is in an eroding sort of uh, zone positive is when it's in an expanding zone and so what i've got here are um, every day measuring how close we are to that threshold for lots of boys, some are expanding, some are eroding, some are in that dynamic phase of the marsh is kind of growing and eroding over the last sort of five, 10 years. And we start to see that seasonality signal coming in. So in as in as, as you go towards summer, uh, you're actually getting closer and closer to that line where you're seeing expansion, which times with the conditions that are right for the seedlings to be released by the plants and for the seedlings to establish on the tidal flat and if we look at an expanding mini boy it's interesting most of the time it's actually in that sort of eroding zone but in the key period when those seeds are released it's it's over the line and maybe that's why we're seeing expansion versus a mini boy that's eroding you know very rarely does it really cross over that line and the dynamic zone is really hovering on that line when we fit that trend through it so this is really cool we actually have a way to visualize proximity to these thresholds so imagine you're a manager, you want to know um, how, how, how likely is the site, uh, how suitable is the site for restoration? How vulnerable is this site to erosion? You could put a mini boy out and you could fit this line and you could start to see how close you are to it. We've got a little bit more work to do because minus 10, 10, 20, they don't mean anything, they're arbitrary. We want to add like a percentage uh, likelihood of expansion or erosion. So we're playing around with logistic regression at the moment, which I think can give us that which is quite exciting. So going back to the manager then, great. They might be able to get information for one location and uh, some information about if that's suitable or not for expansion erosion. But what about the rest of the site? It's really key to try and extrapolate from um, one mini boy or maybe lots of them at a location to a much larger area, uh, i.e. the whole area that you are ideally going to try and restore. Um, and so what we want to do is find data that covers a large area that we uh, has a good correlation with what we're seeing in the miniboy data. And digital elevation models are one such um, data set we can use. Maybe you're familiar with them, but di el uh, digital elevation models are representations of the height of the land. Um, and they look like an image, but each pixel is, is the height of the land, whether it's, it's, it's higher up or lower down. And what we did was to correlate the elevation of each miniboy with this, this arbitrary distance to how close you are to the threshold. And we find a really strong correlation. And um, for the site we were working on in, in Scotland, uh, about four meters above um, the ordinance datum, that's where this transition is happening. So anything above that, you're more likely to see establishment. Anything below that, you're not. So we can then extrapolate. So this is the digital elevation model of the tidal flat for our whole estuary. So this is in meters at the moment. And by taking the uh, components of the regression model and applying it here, we've converted it into a proximity to threshold. These lighter areas would represent areas that are more likely to see establishment. 
the darker blue areas are areas where we're likely to see erosion. So it's very unlikely we're going to see establishment. And the cool thing is, is that because it's shifting from one state to the other, we can actually define that zero point, the tipping point to, at which it changes. And if I zoom in slightly, um, that yellow line is exactly what you're seeing there. That is the, the threshold line that we've been able to visualize. So in theory, anything north of that line, you're more and more likely to see plants establish. Anything below that line, you're more likely to see dislodgement. So the next task is really to put some values on that, something meaningful rather than just a color, uh, a percentage, a likelihood of, of seeing that or not. And then just to give you a little bit more nuance, um, what we did as well was to look at um, when you add particular variables. Uh, so if you just have inundation or you also include currents and waves in your model, uh, what does it do to where that boundary shifts? And interestingly, it went out about 60 meters at that location if you also included waves and currents. So there's some interesting interaction there that's allowing that threshold line to actually move down when you consider more about what's going on from hydrodynamic perspective at your site. We're in the process of doing the same for mangrove forests. So we're gonna be, we, we, we finally managed to get out, we've gathered the data, and I'm sitting on it <laughs> and slowly, I've, I've got some analysis ready, but I'm not quite ready to share yet, but just to sort of show what the environment looks like. You've got a mangrove edge that's eroding, and sometimes in one location you can see the threshold uh, to the right, an area that is expanding. Um, that was in India and in the Ganges Delta, and then these on the right were from uh, Mekong Delta in southern Vietnam. So you can just about make out saplings establishing on the mudflat, and here large, um, you know, so well the big trees collapsing because of all because of erosion. So we've got sites in uh, yeah North and South Vietnam. Um, it, oh, sorry, Mekong Delta in the south, uh, India then uh, in the Ganges Delta, and then also we're going to be comparing mangroves with marshes. And there could be some interesting truths, ecological rules in and around um, the limits that these vegetation can thrive and survive. So watch this space. I'm excited to share it. So I've got one last sort of case study, um, taking you back to the picture where you imagined being a mangrove tree. Uh, so this is actually a site that was being restored in the Red River Delta in northeast um, Vietnam. And it's a location uh, that we're really interested in because if we can demonstrate that our mini boys are going to help restoration activities, maybe we can have a tangible effect on improving restoration success here. So what we did was we deployed lots of mini boys um, in and around the, the trees that had been planted. And um, what you've actually got here on the left side, uh, trees that were planted two years ago, and on the right, trees that were planted five years ago. Hence the difference in height. And we'll, we'll come back to this image in a, in, a, in a minute as well and go talk a little bit more about it. So we deployed lots of mini boys in a grid uh, like this. The, the image isn't great, but actually where these mini boys are at the bottom, that would be the limit of where trees have been planted. And as you go further back, you've got slightly older forests being established with a large sort of central channel coming down as well um, and restoration then sort of on either side. And um, so we went out with the managers, we deployed them all. And this data shows for each mini boy the range of uh, inundation duration they were exposed to. And what we did, we looked at those values and compared them to data gathered by Van Loon et al. They looked at uh, mangrove forests, um, I think it was within South Southeast Asia, um, and looked at you know, where they were occurring and how it related to inundation duration, how long the tide was in for. And for each species then, they were of some key species at least, they were able to define the range that these um, were found in. And that's what this gold or this yellow uh, band shows for Soneratia species, which is the, the genus that was being planted here. If you ignore uh, mini boy eight, that was actually deployed somewhere else, so it's not very helpful. Um, you can see that all of them are sitting very close to the upper threshold, and a few, uh, the, the means and the range of that beyond that, around that mean go, go beyond that line. And those uh, are ones that we've circled in red, and perhaps no surprise, they're the ones that are furthest out on the tidal flat. And so we can infer from this that really the, these sites are sort of on the very edge of, of what can be tolerated and some are beyond that. Um, 
So what's the real likelihood of success? Let's go back to this image. These are the trees that were planted and you can see they're planting quite a high density. Um, this is exactly what was done on the patch behind, but there's much fewer trees. And if you look at the trees that have survived, they're bent, there's not many leaves on them, you know, and there's a lot of biofouling on them. So the trees, they're not in the best state of health. And this is the problem. This is, you know, if you, if you deem a, a tree to survive for one or two years, then the success rates are great. But when you actually look at the longer term, when you're trying to get to a tree that is going to survive for, um, you know, 10, you know, at least 20 years to the point where it can sort of start to produce its own seed uh, effectively, then, you know, can you really call that success? And um, this is one of the big issues that we've got. So we want to fine tune the work that we're doing and, and start then hopefully to allow managers to really focus on sites that matter most and demonstrate this is where we'll see success and we won't. And a key part of that then, what was great about this project is we got the data, we went back to the hotel, we analysed it, and the next day we went and presented it to the local government, um, which shows then that it can be done quickly and we can get useful results. There is still, I think, more we can get from the data, but it, it, you know, it's, it's a good sort of demonstration. And the general feedback was really positive. Um, there were some issues they want, uh, first of all, a yes, no answer. Is this right for planting or not? Not, is it very close to a line, you know, within the ranges that we expect? So that's something we are going to address. And the second one then as well is that there was real concerns that they would be stolen and damaged. These aren't empty areas. Uh, we went in the middle of the night when the tides were low, full of cockle pickers, people collecting oysters as well, all sorts of activities going on there. They're really important environments for a number of reasons. And for that reason, we've got to be a bit careful with, with you know, mini boys and when we deploy them. So those are the two take-home messages, but it's really key to actually move out of the, the lab and the field to engage with local, with the communities that want to benefit from this, get their feedback and then um, you know, adapt accordingly. I'm nearing the end now, just a couple of other cool examples that we've done. Uh, we're working with a team in um, Brighton Uni, that uh, we're linking um, flow rates with sediment flux to get an idea of large scale movement of sediment between restoration sites. So this is that, that, that Kumaivi restored marsh we saw earlier. We've got a master's student who's doing some really cool work looking at characterizing um, priority EU habitat species on the coast. And um, one of the main things she's found is that if you look at seagrass, uh, versus, so if you if you compare an area with seagrass, an area without seagrass, uh, they look nearly indistinguishable from the perspective of how long it's covered by the tide. But when you look at the currents, they're vastly different. Uh, Mudflats are exposed to a much larger range than where the seagrass grows. And so actually, currents are more important than inundation, and that's something that's actually kind of not really been taken into account uh, much in in seagrass rest restoration work. So a very cool project. We also deployed lots of mini boys around a um, island in the Indian Shundaban uh, in the Ganges Delta uh, that was vulnerable to erosion. And then used that information to get some idea of exposure and fed that back to one of the ministers in charge of irrigation and waterways management. Um, we've got people using them to look at flow rates from wastes, flow rates in uh, drained peat, uh, drainage channels and peatlands, and uh, turbulence around plant patches, all this sort of stuff. So quite exciting range of, of applications. And in terms of the future, so what this represents, I think, for the geoscience community is that there's more and more of these homemade sensors being developed. And to give you a few examples, we've got the laser uh, surface elevation dynamic sensor that measures changes in the height of the land, of the ground, with sediment deposition and erosion. You've got um, a, a tilt meter here measuring current flows in caves and you know along the seabed. And then one that measures light and temperature and immersion rates when coral reefs or, or other reefs are exposed um, when the tide is out. And there's more and more of these being developed. And, and I think they're going to be a bit of a game changer for our community in terms of um, providing low cost solutions, really um, solutions that can be tweaked for our applications. Um, and we're going to see more and more of this stuff come out. Um, a really cool example, if you want to look at it, is the Cave Pearl project. They're the people who built this device here. And they actually got tutorials of how to use Arduinos to build sensors. Uh, Arduino is very similar to a Raspberry Pi. It's like a tiny computer. You could build a sensor like this for less than $100 for long-term sampling, um, which is quite amazing. Uh, 
So just to end then, a uh, little bit of a summary, as you always do. Um, you know, we hope that the mini boys can provide new insights in how coastal processes work um, at the coast, obviously. And then um, we we think, you know, that they can, in alongside the development of, of easy to use tools, uh, online apps, I mean, uh, that they can be taken up by not just the research community, but by practitioners to improve restoration, such as mangroves. Um, they can be used then to identify the suitable sites for restoration. And, and I think then, you know, that the, this is sort of adding to the, the, the tool set that the geosciences community is, is starting to have now from these low cost open, open source sensors. All right, so uh, thanks a lot for that. Um, I enjoyed that, any, any questions? Thank you so much, Kay. Do we have any questions so far? No, I do have some. Can I start? <laughs> okay, thank you so much. It was a really, really nice presentation. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, about the sensors and in terms more of technical part. Uh, and if I got it right, they are mostly uh, designed for shallow deployments, no? Correct. And, um, but, but they are not representative of near bad conditions, no? Because you need to have a minimum height mm. and have the table straight, no? That's it. Yeah. So, so, so that does come into it. Uh, I, I know a little bit about what you're talking about. So, you know, the, if you've got um, what you tend to have is, you know, a, a decrease in flow rate near as sort of with a profile as you go towards the seabed because of um, friction between the water moving above and the water moving nearest the bed. Uh, and the mini boy then is sitting sort of somewhere in the middle um, of that. I mean, it, it, for the for the for the one I've got here, the black one, when we add the fishing line to it and where the sensor is actually located, oh sorry, well when it's fully in a day, it is thirteen centimeters from the bed, so it's close, but yeah, perhaps it's not measuring your precise location right right at the very bed. Um, I'm not a hydrologist by practice, um, but we understand. I think in 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 sort of particularly shallow water, that that profile of of, of the friction as you go towards the bed breaks down a little bit so that maybe the differences you're seeing at the top and the bottom aren't as big as if you had slightly deeper water um so and it yeah you know and with ADVs for example we were measuring them by facing up so actually it was measuring a parcel of water about where the mini boy was was sampling it's something to factor in I think it depends on your application really how precise you need at the bed You're muted, Vita. You're still muted. So sorry. Okay. Let's keep on going. It was about the Salt Marsh project. It's also about the technical part where you have deployed all those all those sensors. Yeah. So you can see if they are expanding or if they are eroding. Uh, how far they were from the edge? Yeah. So it. The edge is hard to define. Um, it, if you've got a really clear cliff, it can be quite easy. Um, we were tending to do it about two or three meters from the edge of, of the cliff. The idea being, you know, there has to be a bit of a balance because any, you know, there, there will be reflectance from a, a really stark cliff, turbulence amongst patches, that sort of thing. And, and there's more that could probably be done, you know, so you could do like a transect going right up to the edge and see how, how that really varies. Um, so it's a little bit sort of subjective, really, because the defining the edge is actually subjective. Um, but we tried to have it thereabouts um, two or three meters from the marsh, from the cliff edge. And they are suitable to being deployed in vegetated ecosystems. That's another one. So in vegetation, you'll have turbulence. So yes, yeah, as, as the water passes over the top. Uh, of the vegetation it'll be you know swirling and, and then you might not get a sort of a clear push on the mini boy directed by the current um, even if you clear the vegetation you know you might get uh, you might actually cause turbulence as, as the water passes over the top and circulates beneath it so we have another master's student as well looking at that problem right now um, and so she's been putting in um, these large um, well, yeah, discs to, to flatten down the vegetation with a mini boy in the middle. So as long as it has free motion, it's not going to be affected by the leaves affecting it, but it'll start, we can see what turbulence might be doing to that flow and how useful it is to measure in turbulent flow 
or indeed to measure turbulent flow, which is very important for things like wave attenuation, for example. Plenty to do still. While people are uh, maybe writing uh, the questions, uh, Rita, do you mind if I just jump in with a, another question? Go ahead. <laughs> um, about, uh, well, we'll stay on the salt marshes. And I was, um, I think there's something I did not understand when you were showing us the, 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 this threshold between the erosive and, and the positional edge of the, the salt marsh. Uh, I forgot which slide it was exactly. This is where you showed with a yellow line the the extent of um, the marsh. In this one here? Exactly. So there's this one. And then in the following one, you showed us that by adding uh, the consideration of currents and waves, yeah. the tipping point was moving seaward. Yes. <laughs> in which is the opposite of what I would have expected. And I, could, sure. could, you, could you tell us more about it? Yeah, so so I felt the same way about it. Um, yeah, in theory, you'd expect anyway, wouldn't you, that uh, if you account for waves and currents in your model, that's energy that presumably will be pushing the boundary further up. Exactly. What it might also be doing is it. We need to think a little bit more about it, but you know, it could be that. Um, it's actually sort of in the it's 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 having an inter, well it's having some sort of interaction with with inundation duration so that maybe we're seeing um, the the sort of the, the force of the tide come out slightly faster. It might be relating to the sort of depositional environment that allows um, plants to establish on the edge. Actually, this is one of my questions that I'm looking at now to try and sort of uncover. Is it just a sort of a methodological quirk? So is it because it could also be error, essentially, in the model? OK, um, because you get a better model when you incorporate all the parameters um, than if you just did inundation alone. So it, what I want to try and do is put some error bars around it. And, and we might see that really it's, it's no real sig sort of significant difference from that. So. I'll get back to you. <laughs> okay, okay. And so on that, uh, I also just realized that um, we still had the chat uh, uh, blocked off uh, for the users. So uh, sorry for all of you who tried to reach reach us. Uh, but yeah, now it is open and you, and you, and you can, uh, you can uh, uh, write your questions. And so to give you a bit more time to do that, um, once we, if we go back to the slide just before where, where you really helpfully show us the, um, those two uh, seedlings that are going to have a, a good and a bad life. Yes. Um, once this vegetation establishes itself, the that threshold point is starting. It will move quickly, or how do we? Yes. How do I look at this forward in time as the the vegetation yeah. condition changes itself? That's a great question and something else we're very keen to look at. So, so these plants are what we call ecosystem engineers. Um, so they actually modify the environment around them to improve their success. Um, and so the, the simplest way, or one example of that is that you can imagine if you put some vegetation on a bare tidal flat, suddenly you're introducing friction. So that when the tide comes in, when sediment in that water passes over the plant, it gets captured yeah. and that plant starts to raise its elevation that not only does it uh lower inundation at that location which is probably a good thing for the plant a lot of that material that comes in is nutrient rich so it grows better which means it captures more material which mm -hmm. means it grows better and you initiate a positive feedback um uh and 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 then of course this threshold is going to be moving because you've got lower inundation and so on um so yeah, this is not a fixed line, you know, it's, it's, it's seasonal, um, as we showed in those previous plots where it was sort of moving up and down for each location as we went from summer to winter. So what it'll do at best is give you an indication really of, of right now, this is probably the areas that are suitable and the areas that aren't for planting. And what we've got, right, we've got some sensors out amongst some seagrass. Um, it's, it's the Nultii, so it's the dwarf seagrass that you see a little bit higher on the tidal. We put them out amongst the plants and we're going to hopefully see that as the, the, the season grows and the plants grow, we're going to start to see the shift in, in that threshold, basically, versus an area where there is no seagrass in a sort of similar elevation and start to see, you know, that 
measure the effect of that engineering process on where that tipping point moves. Okay, yeah. That is that is that is really cool to be able to observe that almost uh, in it's, real time. It's, yeah, it'd be very very cool, and you get you get these things like bistable states as well uh, that you might potentially be able to detect. There's a lot of ecological theory we can potentially start to uncover with this, which is which is really oh, that cool. is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Great, great, great. Haditi, I see. Ah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I just wanted to follow up because it was in the same uh, chain of thought, but it might be a very silly question about the mini boys. I mean, they look really tiny, so they are mini, right? A few centimeters or something. So when you have like sediment deposition, when, when you know, like water is coming in, is mm. there, are there instances where you have like the movement of the boys itself is hindered? Like, yeah, because yeah. and then you can't measure the angle properly or something? It's a great question. Um, so, it, yes, it can happen. Um, and it happened more with the original mini boy. So with this one, you can mm -hmm. hear that. We added that yeah. lead shot. So it, it's not going to be moving freely around. It is packed in the bottom. But mm -hmm. what we actually found was that um, as well as increasing sensitivity, what it meant when the tide was sort of coming in, it, was, it had this self-scouring effect. And so it's actually digging out the sediment around it. Um, it doesn't affect its ability, you know, to, to sort of detect colors unless there's a huge trough and you start to introduce turbulence, mm -hmm. but it actually just keeps deposition away. And we found that the, the area around might, might elevate slightly, but the mini boy is still able to move. You know, um, we're talking about deployments here for three months tops. We don't really recommend going beyond that because the environment starts to change, you know, the, you got to think about the height, all mm -hmm. that sort of stuff. But in that period, it does keep it off. And that was also be, be, um, in the Mekong and the sediment, the super, super thick sediment, lots of it moving around. Um, yet the mini boys survived, you know, and we were able to find almost all of them. There were a few casualties, but it's great. Um, the other one then just to note was algae as well. Uh, and in fact, we had uh, the, our MSc student who was doing her seagrass work, um, she did find that there was a bit of a bloom and it got entangled around the mini boy. And you can see in the data, you know, it's it's always reaching totally upright. And then suddenly it's not. And in, in fact, it was getting slightly worse. And they can be compromised as well. I've found cracks and holes in them. One was attacked by a boar in, in, in uh, India and another had like a perfect circular hole. I, I don't know what could have done that. It looked like a drill. It wasn't a human, I doubt, but uh, yeah, some creatures also attack it. Um, and then again, if it fills with water, the logger is waterproof. So you have got data and luckily you can look at the raw data and you can see very clearly, you know, it, the, the, the range of values declines and declines. So uh, you can cut that off basically and still use some of the, the useful data from it. So yeah, good question. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, but usually how much sediment do you expect? Like different different places have like different amount of sediment deposition and behavior and things like that. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and in fact, I have lost one because of um, extreme sediment deposition when the cliff collapsed and landed on top of the mini boy. Um, so I've never found it again. So that can happen. Um, but yeah, site, it'll vary a lot with with, with sites. Um, the, the one here, for example, Calaverock is... Uh, macro tidal so 7.5 meters is a very large tidal range and with that you've got very strong flood and ebb currents even more so that it's like a funnel shaped estuary so all that water is being squashed into quite a narrow area um, so this would be considered quite a dynamic um, environment that said um, because you know the, the marshes can only tolerate so much dynamism they need some they need some for material to be brought in or not but really the line that you're going to get is going to be defined by sort of extreme environments so um where we've deployed them even here um in the mekong and so on we've we've not seen excessive sedimentation but there's there's no reason why there could be a large event a channel could shift a big storm could come in and you could lose them that way mm -hmm. so there, there are certain limitations i mean one of the big benefits is that you know you're talking something that costs like four, four, 400 euros maybe it's 500 euros um but um you know an adv for example would, would cost a lot more th tens of thousands uh so you're willing to try uh yes. i think which is great which is why we can start to get capture things you know the 
start to measure the influence of extreme events on these systems, which are typically hard to capture, stuff like that. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Fantastic. Then, yeah. So just before leaving maybe uh, the, the floor to Rita to, to close the discussion, since it's uh, past the hour, just a reminder, uh, uh, everyone, you were maybe still figuring out how to shape your question. Uh, you can always use the Discord to, to type it in and uh, Kai will be there to, to answer. Uh, I encourage you to, to have a look. And otherwise, Rita, I'll let you uh, close the day. Thank you, Luca. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. It was a pleasure, Kate. We could stay the whole afternoon speaking about the, the census and, and, and the study area itself. So um, as Lucas said, you can also revisit the talk in the um, YouTube channel. Don't forget to do it or in our website. Thank you so much. And don't don't lose the, the next the next talk next week. Okay. Thank Bye you. everyone. Thanks Thank a lot. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Guy. Bye everyone. So I did your who's recording.